Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to our online event dedicated to the climate progress in the energy sector, a part of uh, the Middle East Institute Spotlight on COP27. My name is Andrei Kovatariu. I'm a non-resident scholar in the climate and uh, water program here at MEI, and today I'll be hosting and moderating this event from, uh, from Brussels. We have a great uh, group of experts uh, in the panel today. So from London, we are joined by Carol Knuckle, uh, founder and CEO of Crystal Energy, and also member of the Economics and Energy Program Advisory Council here at MEI. From Bucharest, uh, Julian Popov, former Bulgarian Minister of Environment, uh, European Climate Foundation Fellow, and also chairman of the Buildings Performance Institute Europe in Brussels, is also joining us today. And from San Francisco, we have uh, Piyush Verma, he is a senior governance expert in, uh, in energy at the United Nations Development Program in New York. Once again, thank you all for joining me today. Energy security concerns have become even more salient in recent months uh, as countries uh, scramble to secure their energy needs in the new geopolitical context. Uh, soaring prices have triggered inflation uh, throughout the world and the recession is looming. Current challenges are pushing security of supply to the top of the priority list, uh, yet the climate crisis is also becoming more visible with uh, rec record heat waves, uh, droughts and floods uh, making the headlines every day. The question now becomes whether uh, energy security and independence can be equivalent to decarbonization both in the short and longer run. Moreover, transition costs have critical minerals has also seen demand outstrip supply. And this year's COP event seeks to prioritize uh, conversations on financing the energy transition and uh, on mitigation measures. And today we will explore these topics and questions uh, and many other questions and topics uh, while debating on the current status of climate progress in the energy sector. Whether or not we will uh, manage to find the answers, that remains to be seen, but that's our goal for the next uh, hour or so. And before starting, I would like to remind uh, our audience uh, uh, on YouTube uh, live that the chat, uh, uh, the chat fun the, the Q&A, sorry, the Q&A function is open. So uh, um, we will be monitoring it and we will address potential questions that uh, we are receiving there either in the main conversation uh, or at the end of the session. So please send us your remarks and comments uh, via the chat uh, function. And I will start the conversation uh, by asking um, each of our speakers um, uh, the same question, which is actually a request for, for their brief overview on the current climate status regarding the energy sector uh, in the anticipation of, uh, of the upcoming uh, COP27 event. And uh, maybe Carol, I, I, I would start with you. What, what is your view on uh, the current status on, on, on the, the current climate status regarding the energy sector? Panic. In one word. Uh, well, look, I mean, this is a situation today, not only here in Europe where I'm sitting, but almost everywhere. Uh, but it would be a bit simplistic if we narrow it only to what's happening in the energy sector today. Uh, and that's why whatever we talk about in terms of uh, climate meetings, we have to understand that we are in completely different territories than where we were a year or two years ago because we have been facing one major crisis after the other, starting with the pandemic in 2020, which was described as a crisis like no other by the IMF. And this has distorted, if you want, market realities with all the generous supports that governments have pursued to uh, save the economies from collapsing, from the Great Recession. But that has left many governments around the world heavily indebted. And at the same time, just as we were recovering from uh, the pandemic, we were hit by another geopolitical development, mm -hmm. a major crisis in Europe, and which involves a key player in the global energy scene, what that is Russia being a large uh, oil and gas exporter, particularly here to Europe. And today, for example, you see how governments, particularly in Europe and elsewhere, have also opened the tab to save their uh, economies, to support the households, to sa save businesses from going bankrupt as they face high energy prices. And that will have further repercussions on any, any energy policy that you advocated as a government only two years ago. So with mm -hmm. this new length, we are seeing a major overall in energy policy, in priorities, and even in terms of messages to investors. But will that be enough to encourage the much needed investment in the energy sector to go ahead and move forward into a greener and more sustainable energy future? Mm -hmm. I fear there are many question marks still out there. 
Absolutely. So an overlap of different layers of crisis and also uh, different scenarios ahead. Uh, thank you for that. We will come back to this. Uh, Julian Popov, um, same question to you. Uh, the current status, uh, climate status, if we refer to the energy sector, what would you, uh, how would you see it at the moment? Yes, I very much agree that uh, there are several crises on top of each other. Many people um, define that as a perfect storm. Mm. Um, I see it more like an earthquake with ongoing tremors, which we don't, we we never know when the next one will come, how many there will there will be, and whether the next one will be stronger or 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 lighter, and whether all that. Uh, kind of series of crises will um, calm down. Uh, I mean, obviously, the mm, the, the COVID crisis uh, disrupted massively the supply chains. Then the recovery um, was also heavily disrupted from uh, rapid uh, growth uh, combined with uh, disrupted supply chains. And uh, then the pre-war manipulation of the European uh, gas markets from uh, Russian side added to that. That was another tremor. And the big one, of course, is the war against Ukraine. Uh -huh. So um, many commentators and, and many political figures and, and, and also public uh, speakers um, reacted on on this uh, earthquake of energy related crisis with the statement oh, now now it's not the time for uh, for green policies it's not the time for climate policies we will either have to forget about them or postpone them but uh -huh. actually exactly the opposite is happening I mean the, uh, we're seeing in Europe that there is a massive surge in um, renewable energy installations. Across the world, there is a, a strong increase in renewable energy, and mm -hmm. but also the other technologies related to demand response, yeah. to, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. So, um, in that sense, I think that on one hand we will continue with this uh, uh, the, the disruption and. Uh, worry and and panic also i agree that uh, often we see panic but at the same time we're seeing acceleration mm -hmm. but also but but uh, readjusted to the crisis to the to the war uh, acceleration of the um, low carbon technologies and what probably will will happen in in few years i mean that's that's just a guess we're only in the guessing game now yeah. for the future um probably half of the or near half of the uh, fossil fuel supplies from russia will just get out of the market they can be compensated uh in the next um, five or ten years russia can't uh, readjust that so uh, we will have to uh, seek compensation from other sources and I think large part of this missing half of uh, uh, fossil fuels from Russia will come from renewable energy and mm -hmm. uh, energy efficiency and demand response. So what I'm picking is is basically you're talking about a synergy be between increasing the security of supply and also uh, decarbonizing our economies, uh, and we will get back to that uh, uh, yeah. next. Uh, Piyush, we started with uh, Carol's uh, panic and uh, crisis words. We went to earth earthquakes. What what's next? How do you see the the current uh, climate status in the energy sector? What's your view from from the UNDP perspective? No, uh, thank you, Andre, and pleasure to be here. Mm. I, uh, I fully agree, you know, we are in a panic situation, you know, it's a, it's a time of crisis with all this, you know, the COVID-19 feasibility, the war, you know, how it is impacting the whole crowd in rising energy prices, inflation, you know, mm -hmm. already we are seeing this climate crisis in terms of intensity and frequency, you know, how, yeah. how it is impacting our society. So, uh, of course, uh, it's a, the, the situation is getting uh, worse over time. But when we are talking about this, uh, you know, uh, the climate progress in the energy sector, we pretty much most of the time look at the energy transition angle, you know, how fast we are kind of shifting, you know, towards uh, renewable energy. But uh, let me put something else on the table as well, coming from UNDP, you know, um, 
when we are talking about this energy transition, we need to talk about just energy transition. Okay, yeah. and there are uh, there are still 770 million people uh, in the world who don't have electricity access. They cannot yeah. switch on a light when sun goes down. You know, there are 2.4 billion people, still one third of the population in the world who don't have clean cooking access. And yeah. millions and millions of people are dying because of, uh, you know, the pollution with the cooking. Okay, so when we are talking about this, you know, the progress in the energy sector, you know, on the climate front, of course, we need to talk about the energy transition, but we need to talk about energy access, clean cooking, you know, uh, energy efficiency, which is another very important agenda, you know, and one of the most, I would say, low hanging fruit uh, that we need to tap on, but there is not enough going on that front. So uh, yeah, it's it's not just about the uh, you know energy transition. What I want to say, we need to take an um, kind of inclusive and integrated approach, and yeah. making sure that when we are making this progress, uh, it's a life and death situation in any way. You know, because of climate, people are dying. But when we are making this transition, it is also impacting people. So how we can bring along those people as well in this uh, you know uh, in our climate uh, progress, which we are talking about. I'm glad you mentioned basically the gap between uh, developed and developing uh, societies because we will come back to that a bit later and how this gap is basically widening in, in, the, in the last year or years, as, as Carol was mentioning, uh, this overlap of crisis is widening the, this gap and um, uh, that needs to be addressed uh, also under the COP umbrella. But I would start uh, basically the conversation and the specific questions uh, uh, going back to this um, latest crisis that we have in Europe or started in Europe and, and is now uh, propagating all over the world uh, on ensuring the, um, uh, the uh, um, basically energy supplies and uh, security of supply uh, all over. Uh, I would like to understand uh, your views and understand if delaying fossil fuels phase out, uh, which is happening in, in some geographies, uh, Europe uh, especially, is a solution to this year's energy crisis? Uh, and if so, is this a trap that could also lead to stranded assets and to a situation that we don't want to uh, end up with? And at the end of the day, if this is not a solution, what is the right or the proper pace for the energy, uh, for a green energy transition, considering what is happening now with increased energy prices? So manufacturing prices for uh, green technologies are also increasing. Uh, availability of critical minerals is also um, uh, challenging now. Um, a supply chain bottlenecks and all that. So I, I, I would focus on that. What is the, uh, the impact of this delayed fossil fuel uh, phase out? And what would be the right uh, transition the green transition, considering the challenges that we are facing today. Maybe we can start in the same order. Uh, Carol, if you if you'd like. Yeah, your, your question is quite big, but let me focus on this yeah. issue of investment in fossil fuel. You may recall that in May 2021, the IEA published a very controversial uh, report called Net Zero 2050, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And then uh, there, the, one of the recommendations was that if we were to achieve our net zero target by 2050, we need to uh, stop investing in fossil fuel be beyond 2021. Fast yeah. forward a few months later, only towards the autumn, maybe in October or November, in their own energy outlook and their own oil market report, the agency, the same agency, was calling for more investment in uh, in oil in particular, but you know that would one can say it would be applicable to gas as well, mm -hmm. uh, because this is one of the reasons why we have this kind of high prices and crisis. And I think this is where we saw the big shift. I think it's not about okay. So you can look at it from a short term perspective for a solution for the crisis today. And I, and we have to distinguish one thing. So the decision to phase out or to delay the phase out of certain oil and gas projects um, will help in going through the crisis is one thing because the crisis is happening today and now. Investment is about the long term because you invest yeah. today and you get generation of oil and gas actually flowing to the market in the next few years. So you cannot really talk about the trend in investment if you're only looking for a solution, a short-term solution. And this is where I think policymakers finally are getting um, a better understanding of, because at the beginning, I mean, after the invasion of the Ukraine, for instance, there was a G7 meeting, and one of the things they announced where they wanted to look for supporting LNG as a temporary solution to the yeah. crisis. But guess what? No investor is going to put millions and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, 
in a project that will be only used temporary. And this is where things started to shift. For example, in May this year, the, uh, no Norway made it very clear that an energy minister announced that if Europe wanted more gas, we are willing to send it, but Europe has to commit. And what they meant was has to commit, they have to commit for the long term so investment can be sustained. Fast forward, you know, one month later, the EU and Norway announced an energy cooperation where they openly announced that the EU supports investment in oil and gas in Norway for 2030 and beyond. So they finally, you know, they, they, they understood that if you really want to bring in more supplies, as long as there is demand, because you cannot go and curtail supply if the demand is still out there. Otherwise, you will result, you will face the problem that you are facing today. So you would support oil and gas investment, of course, in a sustainable way. And the good news is that almost every day there's something new happening in the industry that makes investment in that industry sustainable. And at the same time, you pursue the green agenda because at the end, at the moment, with the technology of uh, that, we, that is available out there and the intermittent nature of renewable energy, which has failed to save the day in Europe at least, and also elsewhere, then you would need all sorts of fuels that you have out there to support the transition while at the same time ensuring security of supply. Mm -hmm. So it is really a kind of understanding the time frames involved, what investors are looking for, and, and take into consideration the technological challenges that are out there with alternative source of energy. So if you want to kill oil and gas today, what is the alternative? How will you fly your planes, for instance? You see what is going to generate electricity in a reliable manner. And I fully agree with Piyush about the idea, the issue of just energy transition. Just mm -hmm. energy transition really is about leaving no one behind. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe that if we follow the hardcore definition of energy transition, whereby we would just turn our back entirely on fossil fuel today, how we cannot leave more than half of the world population behind. Uh, let me stop here and I let my uh, co-speakers uh, maybe contradict me or add more to some of these points or some of the issues I've overlooked. Thank you very much, Carol. And I'll go, uh, Julian Popov, um, maybe you have, I think on, at least on the long term, uh, you have uh, similar views uh, with Carol, but I was wondering if on the short run, do you see, especially from, uh, for let's say the Black Sea Basin, but not only do you see a solution in, in uh, prolonging the fossil fuel uh, utilization or not even on the short run, you don't find that a, a feasible situation? I mean, the Black Sea Basin is a, is a very, very interesting place because we were just seeing the Black Sea emerging as a possible uh, important energy source, not so much about the gas, but offshore wind, but also onshore wind around the Black Sea. Yep. Uh, I would add to that the um, offshore wind potential of the Caspian Sea, which Azerbaijan has a specific interest to develop and connect with infrastructure to Europe. So we're talking about a, quite a large uh, uh, territory. At the same time, uh, if we look a little bit down the map and look at the plans of uh, Saudi Arabia for development of massive renewable energy and yeah. connecting it again up to, um, to Europe, and we are also uh, seeing a revival of the old concept of desert tech. So we, we, we see a very, very interesting uh, sort of dynamic of the super grids of expanding the territory of renewable energy. And just when that was happening and, and Black Sea uh, were about to come on the energy map in a, in a very serious way, uh, the war against Ukraine started, and now basically the whole Black Sea is a contested area because it's not just about uh, Ukraine, it's not just about uh, whether we can get uh, ships out of Odessa or not, it's about the whole kind of control of the Black Sea and, and the tensions on, on the sea and around. So uh th that's very unfortunate but uh, we we have to keep in mind that in case this uh of a, of a solution of the conflict the black sea the caspian sea and everything around will come back on the energy map with a very very interesting uh, proposal 
uh, one thing that I want to say about the the investment uh, of in in fossil fuels, uh, I mean, uh, obviously the panic is uh, is is creating a panic reaction about. Uh, uh, for for investment, we have a sudden uh, spike of uh, both of generation, but also investment in uh, floating uh, LNG terminals and some other uh, projects. Uh, certainly, uh, I I don't think there will be more call around uh, uh, yes reviving of some and and using the capacity of coal power plants. Uh, we're seeing that that's absolutely um, natural. But we should look at the pace of, of increase of renewable energy, but yeah. also of shrinking of of, uh, of demand. And the other technologies, all the other technologies that basically will make redundant uh, quite soon the whole concept of base load energy. Uh, if we look more carefully in the technologies, we will see that that time is gradually coming and uh, that is also working uh, seriously against the, uh, the fossil fuel uh, energy. But we, uh, because of the war, Europe obviously uh, is going for the scenario of uh, securing excess of energy rather than running into the risk yeah. of having uh, uh, shortage on a, on a massive scale. I will have a very follow-up uh, uh, question here because you were talking about pace and about uh, the speed of doing that, of uh, uh, pushing the energy transition. What would be, in your view, the right speed? Because um, now we are discovering a new energy security layer, the availability of critical minerals and rare earth, meta, uh, rare, rare earth uh, um, minerals. So this is not in our control. Is this affecting in one way or the other, the speed and the pace of the transformation, the ambition that Europe the and the world has? Um, what I would advocate is uh, fast uh, and chaotic installation of renewables. Yeah. Uh, chaos is necessary because if we want to do it orderly, that takes a lot of time. Order can always, in a, in a decentralized system, order can always be added later. So the, the uh, and, and we're seeing that. I mean, mm -hmm. Bulgaria, uh, which is a small consumer of, of energy, has applications for 26 uh, gigawatt of, of, um, of, of solar. I mean, the, the director of the transmission system operator is, is doesn't know what to do. I mean, he's absolute panic. What are we going to do with all that? So, and and what I would say, just people, companies should take their risks, do things in, in their chaotic way. Self-consumption is becoming a, a massive, massive story for industry and for households. Uh, wind must be accelerated. Onshore wind should be accelerated because this is this is faster, yep. but also offshore wind. And uh, and then we will uh, sort out the rest. I mean that that I think could be the the right mm -hmm. way. And the other thing that is very very important and it's missing massively from the European governments and from the European Commission is serious serious action on energy demand. Governments are not touching that subject because for populist reasons, they, they, they are shying away because they will be accused of, well, so what now Brasso is telling us to stay in the cold, which is completely not the case, but they must do it. Uh, speaking of pace, I'm also interested, Piyush, on uh, what do you see as the right pace for uh, the, the areas, the geographies that you are covering? And of course, I think there are different views when it comes to fossil fuel utilization in some areas because uh, they are within reach for some geographies and probably uh, doing it just would also mean for those geographies to, to have a um, uh, access to that uh, earlier rather uh, than, than later. What do you think about that? Fossil fuel um, uh, delayed uh, phase out versus the uh, a higher speed of uh, energy transformation? See, in my opinion, Andre, you know, um, delaying fossil fuel phase out is definitely not an option, okay, okay. seeing the climate crisis. But it's not just about the climate crisis. You know, we are also seeing several other crises, as we mentioned from, you know, we just saw COVID-19, we are seeing war, you know, we are seeing 
you know, this uh, rising prices, we are seeing increasing debt, you know, inflation and all those things. So there are crises going on on several fronts. And, you know, of course, looking at this, you know, if, especially this year and last year, you know, as, as things have changed, you know, if you talk about energy trilemma, where we talk about environmental sustainability, security and affordability, of course, the situation have changed, you know, and there is there has been more focus going on towards security and affordability of the energy system. Yeah. But we, you know, it's, yeah, so there are there are crises on various fronts. And what I'm saying, countries are at different stages of the transition, you know. Uh, so there is no single pace, like, uh, you know, which we can say, like, you know, uh, for the whole uh, global level, you know, countries have to, and as I said, you know, we need to make sure we, we cannot leave anyone behind. So I think it has to be the kind of country specific approach, you know, um, at what level the country is, you know, uh, to take it, uh, you know, to decide their own pace basically. And uh, they have to decide between short term and long term. Also, mm -hmm. you need short term survival is also important, you know, transition. That's why we are saying transition, you know, it, it you cannot change from fossil fuel to renewable energy overnight. Okay. So it has to be a transition process, but it has been slow. You know, it has been, we have to, we have to act fast, you know, not just in terms of, as I'm mentioning, you know, uh, uh, I think we need to start the process. For example, you know, we are talking about coal and oil and, you know, fossil fuel phase out, for mm -hmm. example, coal phase out. Okay. Uh, we are doing one project here at UNGP from coal phase out angle, you know, it's a, it's a long-term process. We have to start thinking about, you know, uh, what is the, best option to, you know, whether it is dismantling the coal power plant, whether it is repurposing the coal power plant, you know, if you want to repurposing, you know, what are the different options, how you can reuse your existing machineries, you know, substations, you know, transmission and distribution network, you know, your, yeah. uh, uh, all the other uh, machineries which you have in the system, you know, people are there, how you are going to train and, you know, retrain and skill those people, because, you know, if you're going to shut down, then these millions of people are going out of out of job, okay? Their survival depends on those, uh, you know, uh, jobs. So what are the options for them? So we need to think about maybe a more, as I said, inclusive, you know, yeah. how we can, uh, you know, and maybe a country specific approach, you know, uh, what is the right pace for the country? Uh, what are the baseline, you know, and uh, uh, where we can go and how fast we can go and to go fast, like uh, what are the steps need to be taken? And in that, in that decision making process in the country i think it's not just government you know uh, can do it alone we need to bring we have to take a whole of government and the whole of society approach we need to bring people and communities because ultimately this whatever we are doing from energy transition and affordability and all these things which we are talking about it's for the people okay mm -hmm. and it's not about just government making the decision how you can bring people and communities part of this process you know from diagnosing the problem to the decision making and implementation and that's how you you know you build the trust and you know you build the uh, a, a broader set of accountability and ownership you know to be part of this system you know so how it can be people centric approach when we are either we are deciding fossil fuel or maybe putting a new power plant you know people and communities have to be part of the process and I want to build a bit on that, on the social aspect that you that you were mentioning. And I, I want to ask you, all of you, um, if the current situation, the current crisis, and also obviously the energy prices that we are facing uh, nowadays, is somehow affecting the public perception uh, about the speed or the need uh, of, of this energy transition. Because we are seeing some extremist messages, uh, political messages, especially in Europe, but probably not only not only here, that can endanger the very notion of climate neutrality and energy transition. Do you see that? And do you see a, a danger in that? And would that affect uh, some uh, countries or some regions in pushing forward for uh, this uh, green uh, path uh, ahead? Carol, if you want to have a take on that. Yeah, when I listened to the question, I was thinking really I could not identify one single pattern because it varies tremendously um, in terms of where we, you are in, in the world. Because yeah. um, if you are in a poorer country and you are faced with high energy bills, 
and you already fear that you are being left out of the discussion on climate change, of the energy transition, then you would go and say, oh, hold on, that's because of these aggressive climate change policies. If you were in India and China, you can see how we heard even from some official statement that, that the economy comes first and they were not that they have a moral duty to protect the economy above anything else. If you are in Europe, well, even Europe, you know, we talk about the EU, but the EU is a pretty divergent entity because even though, for example, on average, you may find a big share of renewable energy on average, but that share is pretty distorted when you look at yeah. individual country members with country like Poland, for instance, still rely heavily on coal to generate electricity. So it's very difficult to say that, yes, people have changed their mind, uh, because it varies uh, hugely between one place to the other, mm -hmm. uh, not only between the developed world and the developing world, but also within developed uh, rich economies, as I gave the case of the EU. But also people, wherever they are, they don't like high energy prices. Yeah. Um, and this is where you would see the controversy in policy making. Uh, because for years, for example, the G7 were condemning subsidies for fossil fuel that are very generous in the developing economies, and they were calling for, for their phase out. Yet, as the slightest sign of higher prices, they all uh, try to introduce all sorts of caps and financial measures yeah. to protect consumers and, and, and companies, everybody, uh, if you want, in an economy from high energy prices. But if you really want people to reconsider their demand, uh, their consumption behavior, if you want them to shift to alternative uh, fuels, if you want them to become more efficient in, in their consumption, then you should allow this kind of exposure to high energy prices. To a certain extent, of course, you would need to protect the vulnerable household. But yeah. for the reaction I saw in the in various countries to kind of introduce all sorts of measures uh, to shield the exposure of households to higher energy prices, just tell us how powerful is still public opinion and how mm -hmm. sensitive they are to energy prices. Energy, high energy prices have caused protests all around the world long before the current crisis. You see, because people, that's actually the most one of the most sensitive aspects along food prices, for instance, and politicians don't like to face the anger of the population because of high energy prices. And this is what we saw, if you remember the Yellow Vest uh, protest in France, for instance, and that was before um, at the current crisis before COVID hit. So that's why I think today it's not just about whether people will think whether climate change is good or bad. They are thinking about the bills that they are paying. And unfortunately, yeah. the alternative that is out there is not really that cheap. And they would go for whatever would help them to reduce their uh, the burden. And government are stepping in and they are distorting, unfortunately, market mechanisms, which I understand that in certain circumstances they are needed, but in other circumstances they are leading to more problems and further delaying instead of accelerating the energy transition. Julian Popov, I, I would switch to you. Um, do you see um, a challenge in, in, in this current pain of the high energy bills uh, in Europe, but not only in Europe? Is this endangering in any way uh, the very idea of energy transition? Well, of course it is a challenge, um, but uh, we, we, we have to be a little bit politically braver, or not mm. we, but uh, leading politicians politicians, um, we have to be very clear, and I, I, I agree with Caro, and I will go a step further. I mean, subsidies of fossil fuels are absolutely toxic for energy poverty. I mean, they are nasty, poisonous stuff, because uh, basically uh, flat subsidies of, of, of uh, across the board of energy prices uh, lead to higher consumption and to draining of public resources that could be targeting really energy poor, vulnerable people, as well as strategic uh, industries. So for example, if, I mean, Germany is doing that, by the way, uh, one of the richest countries in the world is uh, um, 
supporting its energy intensive uh, industries with not exactly with subsidies but not uh, loading them with green levy for instance and various yeah. other policies i mean obviously if you start subsidizing uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, um, basic price uh, you, you will distort the, the whole market you drain your resources and you can't help properly the energy poor and you can't push energy saving further so it is a very 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 bad thing but obviously it, it's difficult to uh, to kind of step back from that uh, one thing that I uh, want to address is uh, a, a question that uh, Piyush raised. I mean, what do we do with uh, with coal power plants? I mean, I, I was in Athens actually. I mean, on a on a traveling uh, <laughs> tour at the moment, but uh, speaking at the International Coal Conference, exactly on that. I mean, the the massive potential of coal companies and regions for the transition what what i call assets based transition i mean mm. uh, the joint research center of the european commission did a very very uh, good calculation a few years ago what is the solar potential solar generation potential of the coal regions in europe and they came to the con not conclusion it's called calculation that the solar generation potential of the coal regions is exactly the same as the coal generation at the moment at that moment yeah. that was 2018 2019 so now it's basically larger and it's not just solar it's everything else including um the the the, the workforce the engineering force because in uh, mining regions in coal regions and uh, there is a very very high a highly qualified technical and engineering uh, uh, workforce that is absolutely perfectly suited for the energy transition. So if coal regions and coal uh, companies change their mind and mindset, rather than saying we have to close things and then we have to think what to do, if they start just doing the next step and then think about the closure, they will realize that they can basically expand uh, their operations, increase their profits, in most cases reduce their losses, and um, the transition will be much, much easier for them. All co-regions around the world have this assets-based uh, potential that they have to explore, and, uh, and that will be uh, much, much uh, better for the just transition concept than just holding on to the to the to the co uh, generation, the co regions, and uh, and subsidizing prices and uh, destroying public resources. Yush, I want to switch to you and and also come back a bit to this affordability issue because obviously we are talking about support schemes and uh, developed countries. Europe uh, has the financial capability to actually support, to some extent at least, uh, uh, the the current burden of high energy bills. This is not the case necessarily in developing countries, and uh, it must be a challenge there. And it must be a challenge. It must be a cost. Uh, that is preventing those uh, societies to uh, accelerate their transition, their green transition. How do you see that this tension uh, currently with these high energy bills and uh, how is that affecting uh, public perception and in general the, the, the transition? Uh, just before that, Andrew, you know, uh, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on the Julian what mentioned, you know, um, comments about the asset-based transition and, you know, there was a recent study conducted in India, which says if we can just use the existing coal power plant, you know, uh, you know, for repurposing it, you know, rather than complete dismantling, it can pay up five times more. Okay, so we can get five times more benefit, you know, with the existing assets, you know, uh, uh, on different uh, uh, fronts. So there is there is a lot of opportunity, and I completely uh, completely agree, you know, uh, what Julian was saying. Uh, following uh, following up on this, uh, you know, on the energy prices, uh, I think, see, uh, uh, for me, you know, it can it can push a bit to customers, you know, to 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 do energy efficiency, but is that high energy prices sufficient for decarbonization? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, mm -hmm. you need uh, you know uh, uh, inter various interventions at various levels. Okay, to uh, to push decarbonization agenda. But 
we cannot achieve you know the targets which we have you know uh, for 2030 2040 or 2050 net zero we cannot achieve that uh, just just with the uh, you know uh, uh, renewable energy you know we have to talk about the energy transition and uh, i'm i'm kind of very uh, you know um, clear about it that energy efficiency we have to improve by at least 30 to 40 percent okay to to do our targets what we want to do uh, in terms of what we want to achieve you know just with renewable energy we cannot go anywhere okay so this high energy prices maybe can contribute a bit but at the same time we also need to talk about you know uh, what are the you know uh, uh, other interventions you know to promote this energy efficiency uh, agenda we can take uh, for for decarbonization and of course the, as you as you mentioned you know the situation is completely different you know uh, yeah. there are underdeveloped countries developing countries you know uh, and high energy prices can push in some situation can push people into chronic energy poverty you know uh, it can be it can create for some people intermittent energy poverty you know they can they can uh, the the issue is also linked with the you know whole water energy crisis and the food energy crisis so it's not an easy easy thing you know it it's connected with so many other stuff yeah. so uh, i think we it's it's time to do a system thinking and how the system thinking you know can help uh, uh, you know, uh, bringing people out of energy poverty, you know, and making sure that uh, all these other crises are also uh, getting addressed. Carol, I want to get back to you because you were mentioning uh, financing a couple of times. And um, we've seen and we are witnessing a number, an increased number of financing opportunities and, and options across the world. Uh, but investors, and I've, I've, I've talked to investors from across the world, from Europe, from North America, from Africa, um, they're complaining about um, feasible projects not being uh, written, not being available there to absorb this, this, uh, this funds at a higher pace. Uh, what is needed for this to scale up? What is the missing link in that? Uh, is this a, a chronic issue or uh, is just temporary and things will, will adjust in time? What do you think about that? Again, I would go back to the basic of what drives investment. So expectations of future prices, costs, and of course, government policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and this is where on the latter, I would like to put greater emphasis because we're not going to the debate about price expectations, nor the cost yeah. and the cost are affected also by price expectations. Uh, but also government policy to a large extent can sometimes outweigh or, or, or more than compensate for uh, price expectations. Because when you have policy uncertainty, when you have a lack of clarity or um, ad hoc policy measures introduced and announced, one government comes, announces something, another com government comes and then removes those policies. So in this kind of climate, investment would be very reluctant to commit to any project that is that has a long payback period and you know returns to accrue over also the long term and and that for and that by itself is a major handicap i know julian or previously talked about chaotic expansion I, I, I'm very so careful when I when I use this kind of expressions because you need to think about regulations. I mean, what, look at the targets, for example, for, for renewable energy. What governments say and what is implemented are two different things because they yes. are setting very ambitious targets, but they don't they lack the administrative capacity or the regulatory capacity to speed up approvals, for instance. So we are seeing that there are lots of bottlenecks because of approvals, because maybe there is lots of demand there, but the approval process is, co is causing delay and delay is uh, is a cost for business because time is money at the end. So, um, so this is where, you know, the issue of uh, policy consistency or lack of policy consistency, policies that withstand the change in government that are really more like um, more robust, that gives greater uh, certainty, and also supporting administrative capacity for governments to, to, to speed up and then be up to the same uh, level of the challenge and the scale needed uh, to expand this kind of investment. And I'm not only thinking about the developing economies where that is more or less a more chronic problem, particularly the poorer countries, you know, they have lots of natural resources, lots of minerals and metals that you will need to support the energy transition, but they lack the institutional framework to allow you know, a sustainable investment in uh, those metals and minerals. But I'm also having this problem, facing this problem in the developed economies where I think 
governments underestimated the reg regulatory challenge ahead, especially when technology moves faster than regulation, which is usually the case. And this is where I'm going to bring in one more layer to our discussion just to make things a little bit more complicated. Technology is moving at a rapid speed. Uh, yeah. Digitalization, artificial intelligence, that is going to be to play an important role in the energy transition as we saw, for example, in the IPCC report published this year and other publication, they do emphasize the role of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, smart technologies. But they, they actually expose us to a new kind of challenge, the issue of cybersecurity, but there's also so the issue of regulations, mm -hmm. um, are we, do we have regulations in place to allow that technology to be more widespread without infringing, for example, on property rights or privacy or whatever? So I think we're still um, peeling the layers of a very complex issue. And government policy, I think, needs to get to become more grounded to allow investment to flourish. And then the rest will fall in because investors deal with commercial uncertainty yeah. that they are accustomed to. But government policy, I think, can play an equally important role in driving investment in certain sectors and certain areas. Before switching back to Julian Popov, I uh, just want to say that we have less than 15 minutes. So uh, if the audience has any questions, now is the moment to, to address them in the Q&A uh, 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 chat option. Uh, and we will maybe uh, take them at the end of the session. Uh, Julian Popov, addressing on that, maybe addressing or uh, responding to Carol's comments uh, on, on this uncertainty. And I would add another layer. Would the, the, the next COP event, would, would it be a an opportunity to somehow put together these challenges or these concerns and um, maybe increase a bit the, the certainty related to regulatory, related to macro uh, targets, and how to uh, somehow capitalize on the existing uh, funding opportunities and uh, investors' uh, funds? I mean, COP is a global um event and um i don't think the the regulatory affairs could be sort of fixed there uh, it is probably more of a place where general directions could be could be sure. given and countries can share their experiences uh and uh, I, I want to address also to, to to come back to this chaos things which is also um uh, linked not only to, to Europe, but it, it's sort of global. Um, I mean, I'm not advocating to kind of create chaos. I'm advocating mm -hmm. to allow it, to allow the entrepreneurial chaos to thrive. Because, uh, I mean, uh, yes, some order is necessary, but uh, going back to the Bulgarian case, Bulgaria has a target of 2.7 gigawatt of solar by uh, 2030. At the moment, there are 26 gigawatt of applications for solar, so that's 10 times more. Uh, and, and that's the case in many places. So we are seeing globally a massive push for solar, sometimes uh, this is a hype that has to be kind of cooled down a little bit, like the massive hype around hydrogen. I mean, many politicians, including people who don't make a difference between hydrogen and uh, and carbon dioxide, because in some languages they, they sound very similar, uh, saying, quote, hydrogen is the future of everything. I mean, a, a British minister who went out the other day uh, yesterday or today, I can't remember, uh, um, a, a, quite a comical figure uh, announced in the British Parliament that hydrogen is the silver bullet of everything. So it's not, but you have to allow the, the entrepreneurial energy, especially in that moment, to thrive across the world and give some direction on, um, on targets, on... Uh, finance, but mm -hmm. also uh, restructure and rethink the, the financial promises. I mean, that might sound quite extreme, but I think we have to also rethink this uh, famous uh, $100 billion yeah. uh, climate fund promise, because that promise was made when um, the, the energy economy was completely different, when the renewable energy was very expensive. Now it is the cheapest. So this kind of promise have to be rethought, restructured, but I don't see any political um, appetite for that because 
whoever on political level raises this question, they will kill him on the on on stage. I'm happy you brought that because it's exactly what I wanted to uh, ask Piyush. Um, do you, I mean, from your position and working with people in in uh, developing new societies and economies. Uh, what do you think we should expect from this year's uh, COP event uh, when it comes to the 100 billion uh, pledge for the, I mean, yearly 100 billion pledge for developing countries to take climate action? Any progress envisaged there? Uh, do you see any steps uh, moving forward there? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, Andre, you know, it is going to be on the top of the agenda that uh, this developed country, you know, they are not able to fulfill their promise of $100 billion annually, which was needed to be provided. So that will be, I think, one of the uh, important discussion and not just on that front, but also the other conversation around loss and damage, which is speaking up, you know, I think it was an important issue in the uh, last year COP as well. Uh, yeah. The conversation did not move much, but uh, of course there is more expectation in this COP around that. So this uh, whole this investment is, is is a really big issue and on uh, various front, you know, and I think uh, all these developing countries, you know, they are going to put very strongly on the table uh, as long as that is uh, the money is flowing, uh, you know, then only things can happen. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the things will not progress. I understand that in this past, you know, what we are seeing in terms of COVID crisis or war, you know, it has, I think, slowed down that uh, investment flow. But I think yeah. there was a recent report that still until 2023 or 2024, I think this promise cannot be fulfilled. But on the other hand, there is a recent IPCC report that saying we cannot achieve this, you know, 2050 agenda uh, unless uh, until we increase this annual investment into clean energy and energy efficiency by at least six times. Yeah. So think about how much investment is needed and how much is going into. And I would also like to put other issue on the table, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, Carol was mentioning around the digital and uh, cybersecurity and all this. I think there is a lot of issue on the skill and talent as well, you know. Uh, are there enough talent to talk about AI technology, you know, uh, not just in the tech front, but also in the policy side? Think about how many energy ministries, energy departments in the world talking about AI, you know, or maybe there is a separate digital department and there is a separate energy department. How many are collaborating of integrating or uh, utilizing, uh, you know, these digital technologies into the energy sector, okay? So there is a huge, uh, I would say, uh, lack of, you know, um, uh, uh, talent. So we need to invest a lot on the capacity building as well, you know, and thinking about the the uh, the long term on that because how we can increase, uh, you know, from from the schooling system, you know, yeah. because we are talking about 2050, you know, 2060. So we have to increase on the on the complete the value chain. I would say, you know, uh, we have to work on and and the different layers of uh, you know the uh, talent building process. Yeah. As we. Um need to wrap up soon. I, I would just like to have one final question and maybe a wrap up, uh, a, a final uh, comment from each of our uh, speakers. Um, and I would like to address a, a general somehow question, but is somehow related to what we could expect from this year's COP event. Are we still, still on track? I mean, considering the context, are we still on track to reach uh, the climate targets that we have, the climate neutrality targets? And if not, what should the, the agenda of this year's uh, COP uh, uh, include? Carol, back to you. Are we still on track? I doubt it. Already uh, this has been expressed, these concerns have been expressed that uh, countries, although they are setting ambitious targets, but they are unlikely to reach those targets. So in that respect, no, we are not on track. And maybe in the in the forthcoming COP meetings, there will be a re-emphasis on the need to meet those targets. Um, but I would also say that would, or they would also take into consideration the issue of cost, the issue of financing, the additional support to um, developing economies, to the poorest countries. Um, and there may be you know, greater commitment to accelerating uh, the path. But as things stand, I am uh, much more cautious than maybe I was before the pandemic in terms of the speed of the energy transition. So that's one thing to be interesting to wait and see uh, what kind of outcomes there will be from those discussions uh, but definitely we are uh, i think we are falling behind the targets that have you know the world has agreed on julian popov what do you think uh, how high should the expectations be on this year's uh, COP? Oh, uh, to start with it, it and the and the target is 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 a range 
uh, yeah. and the Paris Agreement, we now uh, speak about 1.5 degrees, but it's between 1.5 and 2 degrees. So there are uh, it, it, uh, they're different targets. Um, the, the, the national contributions in Glasgow uh, started with uh, coming up together to 3.6, and, and these are targets, these are kind of yeah. aggregated targets. At the end of, of Glasgow, they were uh, coming to the 1.5. So the, it's a very, very kind of moving target. We have to press it and push it toward, towards the 1.5. But I would mm -hmm. come back and say that uh, uh, it is very important to unlock the, uh, the, the, um, the entrepreneurial and technological opportunities across the world. And when we talk about funding and when we talk about just transition, we should not put money in subsidies. We should put money in national development in national research centers. We mm. need research in Africa, in India. We need research across the, the, the world, not having kind of uh, focused and concentrated research uh, in, in few countries and then delivering the research results somewhere else. But the, the, the research funding should be spread much more evenly. And uh, that I think the the enterprise and research will help us uh, move more successfully to the targets that we set politically. Yush, same question to you: Are we still on track to reach um, uh, our targets? And uh, and if not, what should uh, the COP event somehow uh, try to uh, include? Uh, no, definitely uh, we are not on track. And uh, you know, with the current NDC, it is. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, last it was calculated 2.4 to 2.7 degrees C, yeah. you know, we are going to end up. So, uh, and I think in the last year COP, you know, there was a kind of uh, expectation that when countries come in the next year COP, like this year, you know, COP27, yeah. they should come with their increased, uh, you know, kind of higher ambition on NDC. So there is an expectation that countries will come with higher, you know, level of targets, which they want to achieve. Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, the discussion is also, you know, going to happen on the investment, as I said, including loss and damage, you know, adaptation finance and all those on different fronts. But I think the other issue, which is, I think, going to be very strong in this year, COP, which I expect is uh, human rights, you know, because uh, this is, you know, I, I think Egypt, you know, has been a lot of kind of issues in the behind in the media in the recent, you know, uh, uh, news that, uh, the, uh, you know, curtailing environmental groups, you know, and curtailing, you know, active citizenship, you know, and uh, activism and that kind of thing. So I think, and um, not, this is also coming in the news that there are not enough people uh, are, you know, able to, uh, youth people are not able to attend, you know, so I think that is going to be an issue. I think it is going to be a, a discussion, the human right and the broader kind of uh, inclusivity on the energy transition, you know, how, how we can bring uh, everyone along in this in this process. What uh, I would expect, you know, also that it is very important uh, to talk about, you know, um, I think, you know, if you see last year, we have so many places from methane place, you know, places to, uh, you know, stop deforestation, you know, Glasgow Climate Pact, you know, we have like, you know, joint US and China statement, you know, so there are so many places and I'm sure there is going to be so many places this year as well. But what I would expect you know, that the more we look forward you know, with the same proportion, we need to look backward, you know, yeah. what we have achieved, you know, how, you know, what you have promised and what you have achieved by now. And I think this is not happening as of now, you know, so I, I would expect that, you know, our countries sit on the table and they also look back, you know, when they look forward. And I think that will be really important because it's all about implementation, you know, things uh, will, you know, uh, not just putting on paper, but how to, uh, you know, uh, take it to the ground that will matter. Thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, we reached the end of the session of the panel. Uh, the only regret that I have is that we don't have more time to explore more topics, but I'm sure that, uh, you know, climate change will not be tackled uh, um, so soon. So we will have uh, uh, future um, opportunities to discuss about that. 
Um, thank you very much to, to our speakers, to our panelists, Carol, uh, Julian Popov, uh, Piyush. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining me. I also want to thank um, uh, Mohamed Mahmoud from, uh, from MEI and uh, the team, a technical team for all the support that they, uh, that they provided. And also obviously to our viewers, um, please uh, uh, join other uh, events that uh, MEI is doing on the call event and follow our uh, outputs because uh, there are a lot of things coming in the future. Thank you very much once again uh, to the panelists and uh, looking forward to 